What if the way you've been telling your life story reveals the secret to what is holding you back? Stories play an integral part in how we see not only ourselves, but the whole world. Stories are more than just an important part of communication. They also reveal hidden aspects of our inner talk, which can either support us or end up holding us back from the very things we want most in life without us even realizing it. Join author, mindset coach, and award-winning singer-songwriter Carrie Rowan on her show, Look for the Good, every Monday at 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. when she shares nuggets of wisdom from her internationally best-selling book, Tell a New Story, Five Simple Steps to Release Your Negative Stories and Bring Joy to Your Life. Carrie's powerful stories and compelling guests will empower you to change how you look at your own life while giving you some powerful tools and tips you can use every day to help you feel better and move yourself closer to the life you've been longing to live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Look for the Good on Dream Vision 7 Radio Network every Monday at 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. You can listen online on your mobile device, in your car, or you can ask Alexa to play Dream Vision 7 Radio anytime. To learn more and full full schedule for a full schedule, go to dreamvision7radio.com and evolve with us as we unite humankind with universal love. And thank you, everybody, for joining today. And as usual here on Look for the Good, I have a very special guest waiting in the wings for you, Miss Monica Tanner. I can't wait to introduce her. Welcome, Monica. Oh, I'm so happy to be here, Carrie. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's so good to have you here. And what are we talking about today? Well, I love the work that Monica does, because if you know anything about me, I am a romantic at heart. And so... Today, we're going to talk about all stories of romance. We're going to talk about your love story, right? What is your love story? What is that story that you tell yourself about your relationships that can hold you back, um, that you might not even realize is hiding out there um, in the recesses of your mind or deep down in your heart? And it's so good to get these stories up and out because until you take a look at those stories, you identify them, you capture them, you write them down. I talk about getting a special capture notebook for yourself. And you start seeing what those stories are. You're going to be really surprised at these love stories that hide in the back of your head. And it's no mystery when you look at some of your relationships and then you look at your stories, they're all reflecting of each other, right? And so we're going to dive into that. We're going to talk about some of Monica's personal stories. You're not going to want to miss a drip of this. It's going to be fascinating. So, um, without any further ado, I'm going to read her bio too, because she's really fascinating. My friend, Monica Tanner, she's a relationship coach and CEO of Secrets of Happily Ever After. She helps married couples ditch resentment and roommate syndrome by improving their communication, connection, and commitment so they can get busy writing their happily ever after love story. Monica has made it her goal to lower the divorce rate and raise the level of marital satisfaction by encouraging her students and clients to prioritize their most important relationship, their marriage. Um, using her podcast, Secrets of Happily Ever After, and through her various challenges, programs, and private coaching, she's helped thousands of couples resolve conflict, collaborate, and rewrite their stories in order to exemplify for their children and grandchildren a blueprint for a healthy, thriving, and life-giving marriage relationship. Don't you love that? Welcome, Monica. <laughs> Yay, this is so fun. <laughs> it's so good to have you here. Um, and I just love your story. I love the work you do. It's something that's near and dear to my heart. We talked about this before that I was very close to becoming a relationship coach myself. Um, and I just love the way that you came about starting this business and everybody always has a little backstory. And so we want to hear your backstory. How did you get started being a marriage and relationship coach? Yeah. So I feel like I just kind of came out of the womb, a hopeless romantic, you know, I was like the little girl that always wore the princess dresses and watched all the Disney movies. And I used to like flip my hair like Ariel and dance around the house like Belle. And I just knew that all love stories ended happily, right? Until I turned 12 years old and my parents announced that they were getting a divorce. And I remember sitting there thinking, wait a second, <laughs> this is not a happy ending. You can't just announce that you're breaking up. Like what is going on here? Right. And it just, it kind of shattered my world. And I remember even at that young age, I was 12 and my little brother was eight. And I just started like looking around for 
happy love stories. I was like, this is not okay. Like, how do we, you know, get, not have this happen? Right. And uh, I remember feeling a little bit discouraged because there was a lot of divorce in my family. There was a lot of um, unhappy marriages. And even looking around at my friend's parents, there seemed to be a lot of people just going through the motions of life. And I didn't see even grow, growing older, people just experiencing a lot of joy in their relationships. And so I kind of took it upon myself to be like, I have to help people with this because I, I can't just accept the fact that there is no happily ever after, but I do have to admit, even after I met my Prince Charming and we got married and started our own family, I, I had, did have this story running in the back of my mind that maybe happily ever after is just in the movies, you know? Wow. That's fascinating. But you found out it's not just in the movies. <laughs> it's not. Yes. I, I threw myself into my work and I became obsessed with finding real stories of happily ever after. And I did. So even I've, I've done a lot of interviewing of experts and, you know, I threw myself into learning the skill sets that are required to create a happily ever after. But I've also interviewed a lot of couples who've been married over 50 years who have beautiful, incredible love stories and have experienced so much joy, even through the trials and tribulations of their life. So I do know it's possible. I will be one of those stories. And I absolutely love helping couples rewrite those stories so that they as well can experience the joy of happily ever after. I love that. And our work is so aligned. It's like you're using all my songs there singing the story. So um, I love that you can help couples. And and what do you find is um, one of the most common complaints that you see that couples come to you for? Yeah, I think the biggest misconception or like stumbling block story that people have is that once they get married, their partner is somehow completing them and responsible for their happiness. And that keeps people very, very, very stuck. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> that's a big one. And being stuck is a lot of reason why people come to a coach for sure. And, and that's one of the most common complaints with other kinds of stories. Right. So, um, so why is that, you know, it's hilarious because my one of my best friends that we used to play in a music together with, we had a song. It was a song that she wrote called Make Me Special. And one of the lines was making fun of the line, you complete me because nobody completes you. You need to complete you. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, I love that. Even just in the title of that song, Make Me Special, right? Like you have to be the one who makes yourself feel special. You have to be the one that fills your own cup. You have to be the one that's clapping and cheering. Like your pa partner cannot make you happy. If you are looking outside of yourself anywhere for a different source of happiness, you are going to be disappointed, right? And most often what happens is people get married and they're like, I've met the perfect person and they're going to make me happy. And they get very disappointed because if you haven't established that skill set on your own to make yourself happy, to find joy in your own life and in your own pursuits and like who you are as a person, nobody, and I mean, nobody will ever be able to do that for you. And that is a huge, huge stumbling block for people because, you know, especially when I talk to women who like hinting around, like he should just know, he should just know what I want for my birthday, or he should just know, you know, what would be fun to do for, to go out or whatever. And I'm always like, this is so, so, so keeping you in a space of disappointment and resentment and frustration, because even if you hint, he's not going to know, right? And, the, and right. men do the same thing in different ways. But honestly, you have to learn the communication skills. First of all, you have to know yourself. And this is a, something I always, I talk about in the movie, um, Runaway Bride, right? where Julia Roberts' character was always like changing who she was, the kind of eggs she liked or the way she did her hair or whatever for whatever man she was with. And so you learn that that form of self-abandonment is never going to get you that happily ever after that you're looking for. And so it's not until she stops 
and decides what eggs do I like? How do I like my hair? What brings me joy that she can then bring in the love of her life? But the second act to that, what they don't show in the movie because it ends, right? And where she's, you know, with her Prince Charming and they're going to have this amazing life is you have to first find what it is that makes you happy. And then you have to be able to communicate it in a way to where your spouse can support you and help you in reaching those happiness goals, right? So it's not that they can't do it for you, but absolutely they can support you in that endeavor. They can witness you in that endeavor and they can be your biggest support and cheerleader in in that so that is the reframe that we have to make it's not this other person that's going to make us happy it's this other person that gets to experience the happiness that we're creating for ourselves, and we share that with them I love that. That is so spot on, so beautiful. And then we get to be seen for who we are and appreciated and respected for the individual that we are, because that's what brought you together anyways, right? It's like, you know, the whole thing about opposites attract, Um, you know, there's a lot of truth in that and the more feminine, the, the feminine and masculine models, right? So, so staying in our feminine place is what we need to do to continue to nurture that relationship for, for a lifetime. Um, Sometimes it yeah. feels like a lifetime. <laughs> and I talk about that so much. It's becoming two strong eyes, you know, uh-huh. it's like, whether it's feminine or masculine. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, discussion about that, but it's just being really solid in who you are, what you stand for, you know, the things that you love, like that's really important. It's really important to always be developing and, and nurturing that within yourself so that you have something of value to share with another person, right? Exactly. Yeah. And and differences. I mean, that's what makes the world go round is the differences, the difference between men and women, women and women, whoever your partner is, it's the differences that drew us together. So why do we try to become one? You're not going to become yes. one, right? And that is the second big misconception that just really throws people off is, yeah, people are like moving towards sameness, right? They're like, well, we have to be compatible. We have to be the same. Like, you know, if, if we're, if we're too different, it's just not going to work. And that will also keep you super, super disappointed and stuck and miserable because Mm -hmm. yes, learning how to celebrate those differences, learning how to honor those differences, becoming a team where you, you know, exploit those differences and really learn how to navigate them well and collaborate well, because that is the biggest gift of marriage is opening up that perspective. When you have two different people with different ideas and personalities and viewpoints and opinions and all the things that we are different from each other experiences in our life, right? We get to open up a perspective, another perspective. We get, it's like powerful when you realize like, it's not that I want this other person to be the same as me. I want to learn enough so that I can respect all of our differences and take advantage of them and use them to, you know, better our life and create something even bigger than only I could do on my own. Absolutely. And that is something I wish I knew in the beginning, right? I look back, you know, we're so young and whatever, I've been married for a long time as has you. Um, and it's like, that's something that does, it's, it's almost counterintuitive, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's something you have well, to learn. Become yeah. One. Yeah. Right. It's even in like the ceremony, right? You will become one. No, no, we're going to be two separate individuals. I remember reading a Khalil Gibran uh, poem. Somebody read at our wedding about the two trees uh, that don't go in each other's shadows. They grow separately, but they're stronger next to each other. Right. Oh, I love that. Yeah. It was really, I can look that up for you and send it over. Um, So yeah, it's all about that. It's celebrating that it's understanding. I love what you said about the different perspective taking, you know, how many times I'll go down to my husband's office, which is right below mine and say, Hey babe, what do you think about this? Like, cause his, he looks at it so differently. He comes at it from a completely different angle than I would. So logical, you know, very different than the way my mind works. So I love that about him. That's one of the things I love about him. Yeah. And that's so cool that you even mentioned trees, because I always use this analogy. No two people can see a tree from the exact same angle. Like physically, your heads will not allow you to see the tree from the exact same angle. Right. And so 
got to understand that. Like, of course, they're going to have different opinions. Of course, they're going to see that and experience that differently. So like, how can I get a greater understanding of their perspective? Because it's important. So important. More of the bigger picture. Yes. And sharing your differences actually connects you and brings you together because then they know they can come to you because this might be your superpower. It's not their superpower. And you're, again, that's what they're for to synergistically use our superpowers for each other and, and teach each other. You know, I think the moment that you stop becoming curious about your partner is also a moment that you become stuck because when you think that you know somebody so well that you can almost anticipate what they're going to say, you're in troubled water right there. Such a great point. Curiosity is one of the most important kind of skill sets that you can cultivate. But yeah, can you imagine being married it, it, to the exact same like clone of yourself? Like that would be so <laughs> boring, right? It's our differences that bring passion and fun and excitement into our relationship if we'll see it that way, right? But if we're like constantly like criticizing our partner for being different than us, well, then that's going to make for like a long, unhappy life, right? But you're right. If we can stay curious and like learn about like, wow, I, I just, I never thought of that before, or I just don't see that, you know, if, if you can stay curious and I will add to this equation, vulnerable, what you can create is like off the charts. So that's my, uh, equation that I always talk about for creation, for creating a beautiful life, for creating, you know, a great collaboration or anything is if you can stay curious and you're willing to be vulnerable, mm. then you can create really beautiful things together. I love that. That's so powerful. And, you know, it seems it, it really is simpler. I feel like than most people think it is because oh. When it comes to relationships, people want to overthink it and it gets all sticky because it gets emotional. It brings up all of our old woundings that we just bring to the table. Anything that happened with our own mom and dad, right? Which are all just old stories, right? It's exactly. learning how to bring out those stories and look at them and decide which stories we want to take with us and which ones we just want to leave where they are. Yeah. I like to call it the um, three R's of recycling your stories. Ooh, reduce, reuse, recycle, right? Like I could talk about okay. that in my book. So you might, you know, you might reduce telling it. It's not a great story, but you don't want to throw it out totally. So you just kind of reduce the amount of times that you tell that story. You're selective about who you tell that story to, right? I love that. Um, you can reuse a story. Let's say you have a great story. I mean, you probably would agree that some people think that their worst story is like something they could never tell. But as soon as they say that to me, I know we're on to something because there is some good juice and excellent fodder for strength and all those great, incredible things in that worst story. So you might need to have to rewrite that one a little bit, right? You can reuse it. And mm -hmm. then there's those stories that you really just shouldn't be telling anymore. And those are the ones for the recyclable bin, right? You're not throwing it out. It's recycling still, you, but you're going to put it in the bin for a while and decide what to do with it. So those are the three R's of <laughs> how, yeah, to, how to recycle your stories. <laughs> I love that so much. Thank but you. To recognize what our stories are, we, re we, we, we take our power back, really. I mean, understanding our stories is really, really empowering because I teach this whole workshop where you write down your stories and you look at them and you realize how, what a small percentage of the story you've been telling. And that's kind of like the program running in the back of your mind is actually factual. Most of your stories are thoughts and thoughts are optional. And that's what's so cool about this and so empowering about this, because you can look at those optional thoughts and if they're not serving you, if they're not giving you the results that you want, you can change them at any point. And I'm not saying like, you know, rewrite your history. What I am saying is recognize what is just the thought you're having about the reality, which is a very small part of your story, and then change those thoughts. Amen. And thoughts are, you know, they're, like you said, easy to change, but I think we get all hung up in the, there's a belief in there and beliefs are hard to change. They're really not. Beliefs are just a thought that we keep thinking. It's just something that you adopted. It's a thought that you just have on repeat. Yeah. And I love that. I, I also love what you said. Our, our work is just so similar. I, I teach this to people all the time that Actually, there was a study done that shows that when we go to retrieve these old stories and we're telling stories, especially in relationships, the he said, she said kind of things. Oh, no, you did this. You said that. No, I didn't. I said that. 
you're really only 50% accurate when you pull those stories out and tell them. So it really makes you stop and go, why do I keep telling that story? You know? Yeah. And who am I trying to prove that story to? That's a big one. Exactly. Exactly. And you got to stop and say, hold on a second. I love the the thought of asking yourself better questions, right? Because the mind always has to give you an answer. Wait a second. Do I really like that story? How does that story make my feel? And how's it making somebody else feel that I'm telling that story to? So when you start asking yourself these questions about your story, as you know, the coolest thing about this work is you can never go back to telling that story the same way afterwards, right? Yeah, that's a good one. I never thought of that. But yeah, for sure. You can't. Like when I teach people how to catch their stories, they'll find themselves mid-sentence with that story starting to come up and they go, suck it back in, right? <laughs> Wait a second. I, I didn't mean to tell. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Really- it's so true. It's so powerful. That's why I love teaching people about their stories because half the time we're not even aware, right? People aren't aware that they have a negative marriage story or something somebody told them about love or whatever their story is. Money doesn't grow on trees is one that people think about with their money story, right? So, you know, what are those little stories that are the ones when you can get them out and get them on paper, you learn so much about yourself. Mm-hmm. It's super yeah. powerful. So give us another misconception. I love these. Ooh, mixed conceptions. Ooh, uh, happy couples never fight. That's a big, big misconception that I love, love to disprove because my husband and I are super happy together, but we were in a big fight. We basically skipped our 20 year anniversary, right? Like who is this marriage expert that's teaching <laughs> married couples how to be happy? And we didn't even celebrate our 20 year anniversary. Oh no. <laughs> However, I wasn't running an old story about it. I was like, hey, listen, it's totally cool. We're we're in a very busy season of our lives. We have a lot going on and we, we weren't firing at all cylinders. We weren't showing up as our best selves. And so, you know, we made our 21st anniversary really, really special. So, I mean, you don't have to like, you don't have to love every single season of your life. You don't have to be perfect all the time. And you certainly can disagree about things. I have found that if you're not running the story that we should be happy all the time and we shouldn't be disagreeing about things, then those disagreements usually make you so much stronger, right? You learn so much about yourself and each other and the strength of your relationship when you can just stop telling that story that if, if we were really meant to be together, we wouldn't be fighting or we wouldn't be having these problems and you just lay it out. You just let it be information about your relationship and who you are and your needs and desires and the things you care about. And when you can just pull that out of it, instead of all the mind drama of we shouldn't be fighting, we shouldn't be arguing on our 20 year anniversary. Who does that? Right? Like you pull that out of it and it's just information. I love that. The shoulda, woulda, coulda story. Those are the worst, right? So I love that because just collecting data is one of the things that one of my girlfriends and I used to say, it just, just, I'm just collecting data. You know, you just, it's just information and you're right. Those should have, we should do this. We shouldn't, I didn't realize I had one of those stories that we should never fight. We really love each other that. And so I would get so hung up and so upset after we would, you know, get mad at each other for some silly reason. And so I had to get in there and be like, wait, what, who said that? Like, you know, I love that <laughs> right. one. Right. Oh, that, that goes to like even better, the the worst marriage advice ever, which is don't ever go to bed angry. Right. Like that is the absolute worst marriage advice. And the, as long as I held to that story in my marriage, I was just not sleeping. Like I was a wreck. <laughs> I was like, you should stay up. We should talk this out. And my husband's like, I'm tired. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm tired of talking. Anywhere. Right. And so I finally, when I could finally like root that story out, because, you know, to, I think it was somebody that I really look up to said, never go to bed angry. And so that story like ruled my life for so long. And I lost a lot of sleep. That's unbelievable. I had that same one. I think my mother told me that, but who told her, right? Like who started that story? (laughs) It's horrible. (laughs) It's terrible. It's terrible. But you know, I also love the idea uh, of just being able to learn the skills. You got to learn the skills to get over any kind of conflict. Why not learn it now? Because marriage, you're going to bump into that all the time. So learn the skills now, because then you can take it to the office. You can use it with your kids eventually. So these are the things we need to learn how to do that we're really not taught in school, but are essential when you're that close to somebody, right? 
Ah, so good. Yes. I always feel like, man, we make these kids, you know, take driver's tests and do all of these things to be able to drive a car. And I'm like, why don't we have a similar, like, let's teach you just a little bit of relational skills before we throw you into marriage. Like, that's pretty crazy, right? <laughs> it's so true. Yeah, why not? I think that's a great idea. I think everybody should have an emotional intelligence class. I just think they should incorporate that into schools. Think of how many adults could really, that you know, could really benefit from that, right? Like they need those skills. <laughs> we all need those skills. And I think people want to run away from conflict. And unless you learn to tackle that big one, if you're the flea or the fighter, whatever you are, you need to get in there. You need to understand what the other person's triggers are. And then you guys need to get in there and, and resolve it. And also I feel like find a way to soothe the other person. We're so busy being right. Um, and I feel like that's a huge stumbling block as well, when we really should be able to listen and learn to soothe somebody when they elevate instead of joining them. Oh, yes. Right? Oh, there's, there's so much around that. I mean, you just opened Pandora's box, but <laughs> conflict is so great. I mean, it's so good for us, really. We just have to learn how to navigate it well. And part of that is self-soothing and soothing your partner, right? It's just like yeah. understanding, like, this is just a moment, like, you know, like, recognizing, yes, my triggers are coming up. Yes. This is an emotional topic for me. Um, but you know, there's so many things you can do You can take a time out, you know, you can, you can use practice, good breathing. There's just many, many, many ways to self-soothe and other soothe. Yes. I love that. And on that note, we're going to take a quick little break. Don't you go anywhere. We'll be right back with Monica Tanner. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to look for the good. I'm here with Monica Tanner. We're talking about your love story. And we just ended off talking a little bit about conflict and we we're really talking about soothing. We need to learn how to soothe not only ourselves, but our relationship partner, right? That's who we need to learn how to soothe as well. How do we do that, Monica? Yeah. Well, so much of this requires understanding and going back to what we were talking about before this curiosity piece because the longer we're with somebody, the more opportunities we have to really understand who they are, how they tick, what made them who they are, right? And mm -hmm. so if you will allow yourself, instead of getting super triggered when your partner thinks about something differently or is pointing out something to you or something like that, if you will just stop and get curious, like, huh, I wonder why they feel so strongly about this, or I wonder why this is so triggering, right? And over time and experiences, you'll start to kind of know some of those answers. So like for my husband, money is a big topic for him. It's, it's a, it's a point of, of contention and, you know, it definitely, there's a lot of kind of wounds and raw spots around money. Well, I understand now because we've been together for a long time. I've asked him, I know what his stories are around money. I know that he grew up with almost nothing, right? And so there was six kids in his family and he remembers splitting a candy bar six ways and sharing it on a Saturday. And that was their big treat, right? I grew up very differently. For me, money is like, meh, it comes, it goes. It's like not that big of a deal, but for him, it represents a lot. And so he can get triggered around money, but I don't have to. And so this is a big topic I talk about. This is a big relationship skill I teach and I call it don't jump in the pool because I literally want you to visualize this as it's happening. When somebody gets triggered, whether it's your romantic partner or one of your children or an, a coworker, anyone, when somebody gets triggered, what I want you to visualize in your mind is they're flailing around in a, in a swimming pool. They're not in the, they're not drowning in the deep end. They're just flailing around in the shallow end. They're having a big emotion about something. You may know what that is and you may not know what that is, but either way, they're flailing around in this big emotion. Now you have a couple of choices. You can either jump in after them, which is most what most people do. They see this big emotion and then they have to like jump in as well. Or you can recognize, oh, they're just flailing around in the, in the shallow end of a pool. They're safe. They don't need me to jump in after them. Eventually they'll get tired. They'll put their feet down and realize that they're just in like the baby pool and they'll decide to step out and then we'll be on 
level playing field again, right? So you can just stay there dry on the side of the pool. And this might require that you're soothing yourself. You might have to say, oh, I usually want to jump in when somebody's having a, a big emotion like that. So I, I always like to tell this story in the context of I have teenage girls and they get really riled up in the morning if their hair doesn't look perfect, right? And so this is a time where they have big emotions and it's really easy for me to see that sometimes I jump in the pool with them and sometimes I don't, right? So I'll do their hair and then they'll get freaked out. It doesn't look good. I can't go to school like this. Why did you do this? There's bumps all over the place, right? Like if you have ever tried to do a little girl's hair. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and sometimes I'm like, it looks fine. What are you talking about? Why are you being ridiculous, right? And that is me jumping in the pool. They want me to jump in the pool. Most people who are having a big emotion, they don't want to be experiencing that on their own. So they're going to try and do everything in their power to get you to jump in after them. It's so true. You have to. You can take a couple of deep breaths and you can say, well, I did my best. I can do it again. Or that's all the time I have today. I'm sure you'll figure it out. Like those are two responses you can have that are just you staying dry on the side, recognizing that they're in distress, but you don't have to jump in after them. So those are, that's a really important skill when you're talking about conflict with your partner. Anytime anyone's having a big emotion, I want you to just visualize this swimming pool and they're flailing around. And now you can either jump in and make things worse, or you can just soothe yourself and, and the more you understand about your partner, the more you understand about their pain and their trigger, the, the more power you have to just recognize they're just flailing around. It's okay. They're not, they're not in pain, like, or they, they could be in pain, but you don't, it doesn't require you to jump in and manage that for them. They can do it. You just be there to witness it. I love that. That is so powerful. You know, and I love to bring the neuropsychology of it into it as well, because we were designed to, when somebody in our tribe, right, sends off the red flag, we all send off the red flag. Why? Because that kept us safe for so long, but we don't need that software anymore. We can override that. Um, and so I love to teach people that very thing that you're talking about, because it seems we've been so conditioned. Again, it's just a groove in the record in our mind, right? We've just been so conditioned to react that way. And I love the taking the power back because you're going to just stand there. And what you're really doing is you're holding space by not jumping in the pool. You might even be holding up a towel for them, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. All the time. Yeah. And so you're just holding that space for them to get the flailing out. And then you remain that calm tree, if you will, because we like the tree analogies today, <laughs> standing tall and strong with yourself grounded with your roots deep into the ground because you know, you've got this and the thing, it's kind of like yoga, right? It's a practice. You know, the more you do it, the better you are at it. And you're like, Oh, I jumped in the pool. Darn it. I'll do better next time. Right. Totally. And yes, you can totally recognize yourself about that. Like, Oh, I got pulled in there. Like, dang, but it's okay. Like, it's really okay. There will be a next time. And the next time you can make a different choice. Yeah, it's true. I love that. That's a great analogy. And then you don't get all wet and ruin your hair again. Exactly. So, <laughs> I will do anything to have to prevent myself from having to blow dry and curl my hair. Again. <laughs> and I know exactly what you're talking about with the teenagers. That's a really hard thing to do sometimes. I think it's even harder with your kids a lot of times because we want to get in there as the mother and soothe them and make everything okay. But to learn to step back and just give those nice phrases like you showed us for an example is taking your power back. Yeah. And it's, it, it's, it is really hard with your partner, right? Because like I, this is the example I use in a marriage, right? Is your, your partner comes in like guns blazing about something. So with my husband, a lot of times it's about money. Right. And so, I mean, I can think of lots of different circumstances where he's come in and been like, what are we spending hundreds of dollars on this card? And they're like freaking out about something. Right. And I want to be like, don't talk to me like that. It's my money too. Like, this is my house too. And blah, 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 right. Like that's jumping in the pool. Or I can be like, okay, I can see that you're upset about 
what we've been spending lately. I would be happy to sit down and look at that with you after you calm down or get out of the pool, right? Like you don't have to like jump in, but that is the impulse. Like that is the like, he comes in guns blazing. You're now, you know, pulling your guns out too. And then that just doesn't do anything for anyone. But as far as like the towel, like holding up the towel, I, that's really just grace, right? It's like, he's not at his best right now. <laughs> like, obviously he's had a long day, something triggered him and he's having a big emotion. And so instead of jumping in the pool, I can just have grace for that. I can just allow him to have that big emotion without judging him without being like, Oh, why are you such a jerk? Why do you have to be a, you know, such a poo about money? Like all of these things that you can just hold up that towel and be like, I see you've had a hard day. I know this is a big thing for you. Like I'm happy to talk you through whatever you're seeing that's getting you all riled up, but let's wait until you're dry. <laughs> love it that is such a great analogy it does it reminds me of like when our kids were little and one of them would have a temper tantrum and you were I mean I, I was taught to just hold space don't enter it with them you don't have to literally yeah, even hold them down on the ground and kick with them right like exactly. you're like you're gonna stand over here and hold that really strong space and do you have any tools for like, how do people build up that resiliency muscle um, to be able to find that grace in that space? What is something that you suggest for them? Oh, that is such a great question. You know, I think a lot of gratitude and grace, I think gratitude and grace go hand in hand. I think if you can start every day with a really good gratitude practice and like you teach to look for the good look for the good in your life, look for the good in your relationship, look for the good in the human being that you get to spend your life with. And when you give your brain that directive, like look for all the good there is around me, you're going to find evidence of that. On the flip side, if you don't give your brain anything to look for, our brains just naturally look for problems. So you're going to see like, this is a problem. He's leaving his socks on the ground. I always have to clean up his coffee mug. Like you're going to see all of the problems because your brain is a problem solving machine. So it thinks that its job is to figure out the problems and figure out the solutions, but you can override that programming by just filling it up with gratitude. Like, hey brain, I want you to find all the good there is around me. And when you see that good and you see evidences of that good, it's so much easier to have a little grace when you can see that obviously this person is not at their best right now, but there's so much good that I can just allow for this like breakdown right now. Like it's okay. I love that. I, lo I, I talk a lot about gratitude and practicing gratitude. And it's so important um, because you're, you're starting at first thing in the day. And that's really important too, because instead of chasing mindset, I call it, you set it in the, in the morning and that builds up your reserves, right? So at that moment, when that happens and you're standing there with the towel or not, you have that reserve because you already put it in there. You put it in there the first thing when you woke up this morning and then you come up with little practices to to do throughout the day um, and to keep reminding yourself because that brain, again, will run away on autopilot if we don't reel it back in, right? And um, we got to tell that RAS system what to focus on and what's important to us um, so we can get more of it, which is exactly what we do here at Look for the Good. So stay tuned, everybody. We're going to be right back with a quick message from our sponsor. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Look for the Good. I'm here with Monica Tanner, and we are talking about some incredible stuff about our love story. And we just ended off talking about the pool analogy, and it was just so good. And I want to talk a little bit about this concept that I, I'm sure you hear from people. Is it too late for us? You know, are we too stuck in our ways? And, you know, can one person, if I decide that I just want to do something to change it, is that really do any good? Like, what do you think about that, Monica? Oh gosh, I feel like you just opened Pandora's box again, but <laughs> so many great questions, but I think of marriage as kind of like you're moving it, you know, you, you decide to get married and you, you're moving into this shiny, beautiful new house with so many possibilities, right? And it's your job. You get to decorate it. You get to make it your own. And what happens is as we are married and we kind of 
have all of the adult responsibilities that go along with that, which includes children and careers and, you know, keeping a household and all of those things, our, our house takes a lot of wear and tear. And so 20 years in or 30 years in, this is when I get most of my clients actually, who have the same exact question that you just asked me is like, is it too late for us? Well, the answer is no, it's never too late because what's happened is, is you look around and you realize like, man, you know, the walls are, the paint is chipping and the floors are, are worn and, you know, we've, we've done some damage to this house of ours, right? And it's taken some wear and tear. And so at this point, you have two options. You can roll up your sleeves and you can renovate the house, right? Paint, yeah, walls can be painted, floors can be replaced, just about anything can be renovated, right? If you watch, you know, anything on, on the Discovery Channel or whatever, you can see that you can take anything and make it beautiful again. You have to be willing to put in the work. Or what a lot of people do is they get to that stage and they're like, let's just scrap it and buy a new house. And that's tragic because you're leaving behind so much of, of, of what you've invested in your life and your memories. And, and that's heartbreaking to me. So yes, it's never too late. And the beautiful thing about a marriage is it's a dynamic. So like, of course, I want both parties in the couple to be invested in changing things. But if your partner is seemingly not on board, you can change the input of the dynamic and it will naturally change the output because it's a dynamic. So if you're raising your skill set and you're changing how you show up in this dynamic, then your partner has to change in response to it. It might not be the change you want to see, but typically it is. If you raise your skill set, you raise your understanding, you raise the way you show up in the relationship, the dynamic will change. It will force your partner to respond in kind. And so you can change the dynamic of your marriage with just you, of course. And the beautiful thing about relationship is it is a skill set. It's not something you're born with or you're not born with. It's just a skill set. And people love to overcomplicate it, but you can make very simple changes in the way you show up and it will make massive transformational differences in your marriage. I love that. I know a lot of people listening are like, you just gave them a, a whole bunch of hope right there with that. Because you can change that love story, right? If it's not the love story you're looking for, I don't care how far you are down the path, right? Um, I still feel like you can change it. Even if somebody has filed for the big D word, let's say, right? I think there's still hope in that relationship because like you said, you've already invested so much of your life and your heart into that. And there's so much more to be lost than gained, I feel like. So and here's a little glimmer of hope too that that will add to this and maybe give you purpose if you're in that scenario and you're thinking, man, I just can, can I be the one to change this? I want to give you this idea of a transitional character. Now, this is a concept I learned from Ed Milet. He learned it from somewhere else, but um, it's this idea that anytime you see a family that is healthy or wealthy or happy or has like something really great going for them, it's because somebody at some point in time decided that they were going to change the destructive patterns in their family. So for me, I feel very driven and very purposeful to change the story of divorce that has been handed down for generations in my family. And I know I can do it. I will be the transitional character that breaks that dynamic that everybody has told the story over and over and over again for generations in my family. I will break that for my children. I will be the transitional character. So I will do whatever it takes, which means pouring myself into marriage books and podcasts and taking courses and going to seminars and learning the skill sets required to create a really beautiful, lasting, happy, and joyful relationship. So I'm going to be the transitional character. I'm going to change that pattern of dysfunction. And so you can look 
at your own lineage, your own genealogy. And you can say, I don't like that we're stuck in a cycle of poverty. I don't like that we're stuck in a cycle of divorce or, uh, you know, being overweight or whatever it is for you. You can see that and be like, I'm going to change that storyline for me, for my partner, for our children and all the ones that come after. I love that. I just love that. And that's your legacy, right? The tra- I just love that. I think that's such a great way to think about it because I can already think of ways in my family. My parents were like that in their families. They decided that they were going to break some of the patterns that were dysfunctional in their family. And they did. And they were the first generation to do it. You know, then came me. And so I love that. You know, I think it's really fabulous to be that change agent. And I also think it works in terms of a good story that was handed down to you, right? Like my parents were married for 40 years and madly in love with each other to the day my dad died. Right. And so for me, I want that story. I'm going to make that my story come hell or high water. Right. So I think it works both ways. Right. Absolutely. And so, um, so look at what your stories are, you know, it's like, until we can stop, like we were saying before, and and look at those stories and put them on a piece of paper and say, which ones do I like? Which do I don't like? Which ones are I'm not going to tell anymore? Which are the thoughts that need to be thrown out? That's where the real chains come from. And it only ever takes one person because guess what? All you can really ever change is yourself anyways, That's right? right? That's right. <laughs> I think a lot of women think that, you know, they can change a man that they decide to marry or whoever their partner is, right? And that's like the kiss of death, right? You know what? My dad has this really beautiful analogy about that. I love it so much. He says, you can, you can glue all the feathers you want on a dog, but you cannot make it a chicken. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) That is so cute. (laughs) That's just your reminder right there that you cannot change your partner. You can glue all the feathers you want on him, but you cannot make it a chicken. I love that. I've never, ever heard that before. That's adorable. I love that. So what is, what is it? Martyism. Like Martyism. All that a Martyism. I love that Martyism. Thank you for sharing that Martyism with us. So tell us a little bit about your podcast. If people want to tune in, where can they find it? And what do you talk about there? Yeah. So you can find everything about me on my website. It's just my name, monicatanner.com. But on there, you can find, I have a podcast called Secrets of Happily Ever After. And I, like I said, I've made it my mission to distill out these simple secrets that lead to happily ever after. And that's the thing. I think people love to overcomplicate this, but it's really, there are some simple secrets that help people live happily ever after. And you just have to decide that you're going to do it and then learn the skill set necessary. It does take some work. It does take some effort, but nothing worth having ever comes without effort, right? So you just have to decide what's the most important thing to you. And if it's to live happily ever after, you can find tons and tons of good content and ways in which you can make this your happily ever after love story. I love that. And I think so many people, everybody wants that. We don't get married to not want that. We want that, right? We just don't know how to make it work, right? And so that's why I love the work that you do. And you break it down. You give great analogies. So it's really easy to understand. You can take it with you. I'm going to take that feather story with me now. I love that, right? And the pool analogy, like, I don't know. You just break it down. I like things to be easy for people to play in their minds, like visualize when it's happening. Because for me, if I'm not visualizing that in my mind, I'm going to jump in the pool. We all are, right? How many times have we jumped in that pool when we're like, oh, now we're going to be like, oh, I shouldn't have gotten in the pool. (laughs) And you'll say next time I will do it differently. Exactly. And then each time you try, you try, you try, and you just all of a sudden it, I feel like everything starts to gel, right? Like any new skill that we're learning, it takes practice, right? I didn't get to learn to play multiple instruments because I didn't practice. Exactly. Exactly. You got to, I love that because yes, you decided that it was important to be able to learn an instrument and you put in the time you practice, you decide it was important. My son right now, he's almost 20 years old and he just decided recently to start learning to play the guitar. And now he sends us videos all the time of him playing these 
beautiful songs on the guitar. And what's crazy is I tried to put him in all the music lessons. Like I tried to get him to learn the piano. I tried to get him to learn the guitar. I tried, I put him in voice lessons, all the things, Mm -hmm. but he wasn't ready yet. Like he didn't have the desire. It wasn't important to him. But as soon as he decided he wanted to learn how to play the guitar, he picked it up super fast and he's really good at it. And now he's like, mom, I'm going to learn how to play the piano. I'm going to like all these things. I'm like, awesome. He just had to decide that it was important to him. I love that. Like anything else, you got to make that decision. It's a line in the sand. All right. I'm not going to live like this. Sometimes it takes right enough pain for us to decide that we're going to change it. I don't want to live like this anymore. This is not what I got in this for, right? Or we've given up so much of ourselves. We want to take ourselves back. Yeah, that's a great one. And so we've, like you said, abandoned ourselves in relationship. And that's like a real ouchie when you realize that you did that, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a real big impetus for change for a lot of people. So yeah. go to go to Monica's website. I'm going to spell it because we spell everything here on the radio. Um, it's Monica M O N I C A Tanner T A N N E R dot com. Check out her website. She's got some great stuff. She's got a little quiz on there. What's the quiz about? Uh, the quiz is your level of intimacy in your marriage, right? There's four different levels. So are you guys like hot and heavy or are you cool as a cucumber? <laughs> and you can it ask you questions on there. And then when, once you get your, your intimacy level, it will tell you what you can do to increase the level of intimacy in your marriage. Ooh, la la. I like that. <laughs> so go to her website, check out her stuff get on her podcast because I've listened to it myself. It's fantastic. She has some incredible guests on there. You're going to learn so much. And like I said, she just breaks things down into these bite-sized morsels that are super easy to understand and apply in your life today. And it really doesn't take as much as you think to turn that around, turn that ship around and stay out of the pool. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So thank you everybody for tuning in today. And Monica, thank you so much. Um, You have got a really cool a uh, class on uh, dumping resentment. Is that what I saw on your website? Just tell us quick about that before you jump off. Yeah. So I just created what is called the passionate marriage club. And it's just, it's like an exclusive membership for husbands and wives who are looking to raise the skill set in their relationship. So um, it's, it's super affordable. It's really fun. It doesn't take a lot of time, but it can be a massive transformation. If you just get in there and put a little intention on your marriage. I love it. Put that intention on your marriage and make that happily ever after love story your own that you can pass down for legacies, generations to come. It'll be the best gift you ever gave anybody. So thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you, Monica, for all your amazing tidbits of wisdom today. Thank you so much for having me, Carrie. This has been a blast. Awesome. So glad you made it. And remember everybody, it's never too late to live your best story. Be well. Thanks for tuning in to Look for the Good with your host, Carrie Rowan, best selling author and mindset coach. Join us every Monday at 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. right here at Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. If you weren't able to catch an episode, no worries. Just visit our website to find all the archived episodes of Look for the Good on demand so you don't miss a thing. And remember, it's never too late to live your best story. For additional resources or to find out about how you can work with Carrie directly, visit CarrieRowan.com for more details.